Coming up on this episode of Belief Hole. Every small town street has one. And every kid knows the legend. There it sits like a sentinel. Perched on the hill, emanating a darkness and a hunger. Waiting and watching. Crouching back in shadow from the protective glow of the street lamp light, the haunted house at the end of the block. From tree-lined demons whispering from the shadows to astral battles with evil intruders. On this Halloween episode of Belief Hole, we detail four incredible previously unheard accounts of true American hauntings. 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 So tuck the kids in by curfew and turn off the porch light as we walk the halls and explore the hidden world just beyond the walls. Conspiracy, synchronicity, Sasquatch, homunculus, alien races, Satanism in Hollywood, MK Ultra, Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Close like, the door, in. jury. In. Close your door. What's the uh, inner earth disagreements? Ghost dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman, Bohemian Grove, Felt, Magicians are demons, Specters, and Spirit spooks. summonings, Sleep, Strange disappearances, Sky whale phenomena, yes. Alternative history, Shadow people. Shh, quiet. I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. That's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf towers. I would never talk about. That's old. Y2K. Cover ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Vampire. Well, hello. Hello. Hello, hello. Welcome. It's Halloween. <laughs> Finally. Is it? Yes, it is. Oh, hold on one second. This Halloween, oh boy. be prepared <laughs> to be scared. <laughs> yes. I've never heard anything less scary than that. Never sleep again. I feel like that would scare me when I was three. Maybe it would have scared me. It's not supposed to be scary. It's supposed to be funny. It's supposed to be fun. I enjoyed it. Be prepared to be scared. <laughs> Anyways, it is Halloween. It is. We do have some seriously freaky stories for you today. Yes, we do. We save them for Halloween. Yes, this is a very special episode, a unique sort of episode. We've been talking a lot about Halloween, how it's been coming. Probably yeah. <laughs> probably too much. We're going to take a little break from the creepies after this and move yeah. on to something a little bit different. But Cleanse ourselves, get into the deep 40 and yeah, shift to the stranger side of other things besides just the darkness. But yes, today is a special sort of episode because we are going to be doing something a little different. We are going to be doing some strange listener stories, but they're hand curated, in-depth accounts, tales of terror about specifically American hauntings. That's what we're covering today for Halloween. Welcome to Fright Night. Yeah, I like that theme. I like the theme of, I mean, there's nothing more traditional Halloween than a good haunted house. And it just so happens that we have some really interesting and freaky haunted house stories that no one has heard before because they're original from our listeners handpicked stories that we've saved for this Halloween. So I think it's going to be really interesting. It's going to be a classic light your candles, illuminate the jack-o'-lanterns, and sit still in the dark. Really creepy tales. Don't move. You must be sitting still. Sit very still. <laughs> <laughs> Saw you guys' carved pumpkins, by the way. Yeah, did you like those? We're adult men. We had to take some time <laughs> and carve some pumpkins. Chris really wanted to carve some jack-o'-lanterns. I wanted to get in touch with my inner child. Was yours a, a raptor growling at the moon? It, went, it was supposed to be a wolf. Like a werewolf sort of creature, but I uh, just did it out of my brain. So uh, it looks more like a dragon of sorts. The neck was a little little long. But okay. it was really, I was really impressed, Chris. I was surprised. Yeah, it looked pretty good. I'll make sure I include pictures in the show notes. Yours was forgettable, Jeremy. I don't remember what you did. Oh, I did a <laughs> traditional jack-o'-lantern. You know, weird teeth, big mouth. Oh, yeah. I did make him some eyebrows, though. That was pretty cool. 
That was creative. Like with the shadows and the glow. Mom did like a fall leave scene. It was very elegant. Very mom. Very elegant. Dad had the typical, like the Jack Lantern you see at the beginning of Halloween, the John Carpenter film, like the original on the yeah. on the railing of the house, that exact classic two triangle eyes. Yeah. Anyways. But you're right. Yes, the quintessential, for me, the, you know, nothing is more Halloween than the haunted house at the end of the road. And I think a lot of people can relate to that. John, I don't know if you shared this feeling, but when we were growing up on Stonewood, there was the White House at the end of the road at the bottom of the cul-de-sac up on the hill. It stood there in silhouette. Mm -hmm. Oh, the White House, yeah. That was the house that all of us kids were like, that is haunted. You can just feel it. Probably wasn't. It was haunted by our principal. Mr. Jones, I think, lived there. <laughs> Maybe he did. Pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> he was a nice guy. He was not scary. But did you have any experience like that, John? Did you have any houses when you were growing up? I guess you had a friend with a haunted house. That was Adam, right? You know, I do, actually. Remember the fire station at the top of the street? Yeah. yeah. There was, like, some lore around that people used to see. Really? Yeah, like, figures in that window. What? That always yeah. creeped me out, but I never heard any rumors or lore about that. I remember being up there playing football, and I was always a lot younger than most of the kids there, and they used to talk about they'd see this dark figure standing in that window. Creepy. That sounds vaguely familiar now, now that you mentioned that. Maybe you told me that when I was little. That's perfect, too, because it's like the traditional old, like, red firehouse at the top of the hill, top of Stonewood Street. Right, set back in the woods. And no, it didn't get used back then. Yeah, it had been retired at that point. Yeah. Creepy. We'll have to look into that. And speaking of those haunted places, driving around lately, I feel like certain places seem to feel stranger than normal. I don't know if it's... Woo-woo? What? Woo-woo? <laughs> Woo-woo? <laughs> yeah, it might be a little woo-woo. Um, I don't know if this is in my mind, it could be, but there are two places in particular where I've just felt almost like it's like driving into another world for only about like quarter of a mile. One place is on... Uh, what's that road, Jared, going out towards Marshallville? Oh. It's weird. The road like winds you down into this narrow little yeah. little alleyway. And the the way the light comes through the forest there, you just as soon as you get there, Jim and I felt it at the same time. Just bizarre sort of sensation, otherworldly feeling. It's the kind of road where the trees feel like they're all curling around your car, this like little one lane road in the country. And it kind of comes out of nowhere. It does feel like almost like a portal to some other realm. I mean, it's probably not, but could just be that time of year where things just feel thinner. The veil is thinning. But so that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about not just haunted houses, but people that are haunted. And the land itself sometimes seems to hold on to spirits. Sometimes it seems like long after Halloween is gone, the things that maybe came through remain. Yeah, we have some really, really interesting accounts coming up here. Well, let's get into it then. Yeah, where does our first story come from, Chris? Oh, yes. Our first tale of terror comes from Tyler. It's a lot of T's involved there. Tyler's tale of terror. Terrific. Terrifying tale from Tyler. So this one is, uh, it's more of a classic belief hole listener stories in, in that it is shorter. It isn't a long in-depth account, uh, long narrative. This is going to be a familiar sort of punchy tale. Oh yeah. I like this because he said it's, uh, he kind of apologizes and it says, sorry for the, the standard ghost story haunting, but it's interesting in the way it's standard because it's, it mentions a few things that are not standard. Well, you'll hear, <laughs> you don't really pretty... hear about these things. Some kind of classic haunting type things like things bleeding. You're spoiling all the good stuff. Yeah, shut up. <laughs> we can cut it out, okay? Go sit still with a candle. But yeah, let's do this one. This is a great little one from Tyler and it kind of teases that Halloween spirit, I think, right off the bat. It reminds me of an old yeah. like, Art Bell Coast to Coast little anecdote. Ghost to Ghost AM? Ghost to Ghost AM, yeah. Yeah, I titled this uh, tentatively titled Whispers, Blood, and Standard Ghostly Stories. All right, this comes to us from Tyler and this happened in 2018 in southern Utah. Hey all, I've been dying to share a few things that happened to me a few years ago in an old apartment I lived in. Ever since I moved in, the place had an odd feeling, almost dark or evil. I felt like I was being watched constantly and just thought it was paranoia from living away from my parents for the first time. However, within the first few weeks, I started seeing and hearing things. I came home from work one day to see an outline of a tall, burly man sitting on the end of my bed, which disappeared when I yelled and turned on the light. Ah! All through the same week, I would hear people talking outside of my bedroom door, sometimes mentioning me by name. Once, I even witnessed my doorknob attempting to unlock itself. 
more standard spook stuff would happen. Doors opening themselves, the chair rocking itself, strange noises at night, etc. Once I got a roommate, things seemed to get a little worse, too. He would burn incense for an air freshener. And one time, he shakily called for me to come see something. Tyler! When he was dumping ashes from the tray, blood poured from the hole. He thought I was playing a joke on him. We were terrified. I ended up moving a couple months later. I couldn't handle it. Sorry for the standard ghost stories. I just have nobody to share them with, as nobody believes me. Except for my old roommate, of course. Good little tale there. Bloody ashtrays. Yeah. Thank you, Tyler. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Not standard at all. No. Well, standard in the fact that, like I was kind of mentioning earlier, the blood running from the uh, the incense holder. Yeah, I mean, that's like classic vintage horror film. Yeah, the blood running down the walls. Yeah. And super scary. Not standard at all. I think the extra creepy aspect of that tale when he's talking about hearing people outside of his bedroom door at night talking about him yeah. and using his name. That's pretty that is weird. eerie. And then eventually trying to get in with the door handle actually moving. Oh, yeah. And that's another thing, too, is looking back at some of these old classic stories with blood coming down the walls, which you just don't hear very much anymore. That usually is connected to some kind of poltergeist activity, physical, sometimes violent phenomena like the, you know, the doorknob turning, that kind of Mm -hmm. physical interaction of a spirit with the world. Blood can be kind of a, a manifestation of that, it seems like. And I was thinking, like, there should be a database of phenomena related to different kinds of haunting activity specific haunting phenomena, like for instance, the blood. But I did find a few examples that we would have heard of or talked about the, if you guys remember covering the cursed bunk beds from 1988, the Tallman house. Oh yeah. Covered that, I think in our cursed objects episode in the expansion. That was an interesting one where there was rumored to be blood coming down the walls. If you guys remember in Jerome, (gasps) that guy we met. Yeah. Remember Jerome, Arizona? Creepy place. We stayed in that haunted mansion. Oh, at the insane asylum. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah. The guy we met there, he was like the manager or something of Jet Setter? No, he's the editor of some Jet magazine or something. But yeah. he turned out to be the guy from that classic documentary who was almost hung in his attic by a poltergeist. Yeah. Yeah. From like the 90s. It was a classic haunting and I couldn't remember the name. I couldn't find it. And then, but I knew by his description of it, I knew the story. And I was so excited to meet him because, it was, you know, it's like a random YouTube video I watched a long time ago. But doing research for the, the blood thing, I found that. It was the San Pedro house. Do you remember that? Oh, crazy. Yeah, you found it. Single mom, Jackie Hernandez. Basically, she was going through a rough time and this haunting started to happen. San Pedro, she was trying to start fresh after leaving her husband. And when paranormal activity started, she had these people come over and a cameraman came, photographer. The cameraman was the guy who ended up in the attic getting a cord wrapped around his neck like something was trying to hang him. Oh, right. That's the classic hanging in the attic. Oh, I remember that. There's a picture of that. We'll put that in the show notes. The, I always thought it'd be cool to cover that story. Yeah. So it's really interesting. Well, you just did. Very briefly. <laughs> Do a deeper dive sometime. But anyways, yeah, there's a lot of cases just interesting of the, the blood running down the walls. And there's actually one that took place in 1987. This case is interesting because it's still unexplained. September 11th, 1987, there was an article that appeared in the Register Guard newspaper. The headline was, Bleeding House Besieged. And a brief quote here, William and Minnie Winston, age 79 and 77, respectively, who contacted police after discovering blood throughout their home. According to the register guard, they, quote, reported finding blood on the floors and walls of the house that they had rented for 22 years. Lab tests confirmed it was human blood. However, it was type O blood. The Winstons were type A. Weird. Millie Winston made first contact with the mysterious pools of blood after stepping out of her bathtub on September 8th, 1987. After investigating, his work gets a little interesting and corroborative. After investigating, police would later find blood in, quote, the bathroom, kitchen, living room, bedroom, and halls. Nearly everywhere, and yet no explanation for its existence could be found. The story would appear in the New York Times, and believe it or not, still remains a mystery. Crazy. Yeah. So those are best accounts when there's, you know, police officers involved. Yeah, you know, documenting like the classic tale of the boy who came home from jail, I think, and it started raining in their home, in his grandfather's home, and the rain started going upside yeah. down, and the police showed up. Was that our show? Did we cover we that? We covered it briefly a couple of years ago. I think I remember that. Yeah. Paranormal Witness did a really good episode on that. Upside down rain, never a good sign. That's a fantastic story. It's a pretty famous account now. 
But I was going to say, what a bummer to get out of the shower. You're clean and you step in a gooey, sticky, icky pile of human blood. Boy, Chris, way to make it relatable. How, how gross. I might be able to connect the story. I'm sure that was the first thought that went through their head. I just was all clean. <laughs> now I got blood all over me. Now I have demon blood on my toe. It's just one thing after another. <laughs> that, did hap- that did happen apparently in Oklahoma. This guy, he had blood coming down his walls. Well, he was something red and he wiped it with a sponge. And then his son's like, it's, it's still bleeding, Dad. And so he wipes it again at this point. I guess he realizes it might be blood, calls the police because his walls kept bleeding. Turns out his neighbor upstairs died of natural causes and hit his head. Oh, no. And was Aww. bleeding and it was coming. And the way it was coming down, there's a video. I'll, I'll drop a clip later, but I'll we'll link it in the channel. I want a clip of that. Well, the weird thing was you could totally think your walls are bleeding because where it was bleeding from was like, you know, like an opening in like a bay window for like a, say, a kitchen to a living room kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It was bleeding underneath the shelf. Like somehow it had oh, weird. come down inside the walls and then that went down. That is so down. disturbing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that is just such a weird thing that would, I mean, it's just so odd that that was what happened. Someone actually died and was like bleeding and you're, and you're like, the walls are yeah. bleeding. It's a poltergeist. And then, no, just your dead neighbor. And the creepy thing too is, you, <laughs> the creepy thing too is you're in a, if he had successfully wiped it away and it hadn't kept bleeding, probably wouldn't have called the cops or even like sniffed the sponge. He's just been like, ah, oh, something, you know, is leaking out of my wall. Sniff the sponge. I mean, I just, I just sniffed it. Sponge sniffer. I'm definitely a sponge sniffer. A little it, taste test. It could have just been. <laughs> I'm definitely a sponge sniffer. <laughs> it could have just been some uh, surfactant leaching. You know, what does that mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. Surfactant leaching. You just looked that up. I'm glad you asked. Is uh, it happens when humidity <laughs> causes paint ingredients to drip down the wall. Usually, latex-based paint. It can look kind of like blood dripping, but it's just it's a water soluble. Fascinating elements in the in the paint. When Jeremy starts using words I don't understand, we know it's time to move <laughs> on to the next story. But thank you. Thank you, Tyler. It was great. Yeah, thank you very much. Never sleep again. Is that you, John? I didn't do that. That's weird. I know whose voice that is. That's the guy who played Goliath and Gargoyles and also no, it's other not. things. Oh, Goliath. Oh, maybe. You didn't do that, John? No. Weird. I'm excited about this next story. Uh, by the way, guys, these stories are some of our most frightening accounts we've had so far specifically picked for Halloween. John, this story is pretty terrifying. It's called She Follows Me. This was sent to us by Preston. And this occurred in Springfield, Oregon. It began in 2002. Still going on. Yes, John, exactly. This young man is still experiencing this horrible situation. And not just he, but his family. All right. Light a candle. It's about to get creepy. In 2002, after living in an apartment and splitting custody with my dad for five to six years, my mom and stepdad bought a house in the neighborhood I grew up in. The location was in Thurston area of Springfield, Oregon. The neighborhood was planned, and all of it was built on old orchards and abandoned farmland, which goes way back to the old Oregon settlers, as this was the valley down from the mountains. The first two years that we lived there, we never noticed anything strange or weird, much less even thought about our four-year-old house possibly being haunted or anything like that. I believe the activity began during the summer of that third year. My brother, friend, and I were at my dad's house, which was a few miles away. My brother went back to my mom's to grab something, but he never came back. Since my brother doesn't talk about the things that scare him, We had to later find out from my mom what happened that night. My brother Blake had gone back to the house, gone up the stairs, and was going toward his room in the dark when he heard a young girl's voice say, Hey, Blake. From the bathroom, which was adjacent to the hallway to his room, he apparently heard it loudly and very clearly. He sprinted into his room slammed the door, and slept that night with the lights on. The next day, he'd asked my mom if it had been her calling him from the dark. She denied being awake at the time. Things became more concentrated after the incident with my brother and would continue for another 10 years on and off. During this period, our friend Tony stayed over one night. At the time, I was 16, and my brother and Tony were 15. He shared with us his experience in the house. He said that while he was sleeping in our game room upstairs, 
This is the largest open space area in the house. He suddenly felt someone stroking his hair. And then he heard breathing. At first, he thought it was us messing with him. So he had gotten up, but then realized that at some point the TV had been shut off. It was pitch black. He was so freaked out that he ran downstairs and slept on the couch in the living room. A few months after that, I started to notice little things, little things that would happen in that game room when the door was open. The small hallway upstairs was perpendicular to the game room. And if you wanted to go downstairs, you had to walk towards the room and take a right down the staircase. I started noticing things that were blacker than black, walking back and forth in the already dark room. At night, with the shades down, that room was extremely dark, and to see things moving back and forth was terrifying. It almost seemed like there were groups of entities walking back and forth. This was before I ever heard about shadow people. A couple weeks later, my brother and I were watching TV, late at night downstairs, and my brother had passed out. After about 20 minutes, I saw movement in the darkness of the stairwell, which was right across the living room where we were. I fixated on the movement, and then I saw something in a light-colored robe, slowly sliding down the stairs, Ooh. as if it were floating, not walking. I saw a hand, or something like it, stretch out onto the railing which faced me. Initially, it scared me, but then I thought it might be my mom because she wears a robe at night and also has medium-length dark hair. Unfortunately, that comfort didn't last but a second, and then whatever it was just faded into nothing at the bottom of the stairs. I was already shaking my brother by this point. He didn't really care what I told him I saw, and he didn't believe me. But it was comforting to have someone awake with me then. So this is interesting. When he's recounting this experience, upon rereading this over and over, I realized what he was describing was that at the end of this hallway, seems to be where a lot of this activity is taking place or the source of this. So this is that game room area, right? That at night is open. He noticed these things that start to begin to happen. And he's seeing these dark figures walking around up there at night in the distance from down the hallway. Also, where what he thinks for a moment is his mom coming down the stairs, or he thinks maybe that's who this woman is with the dark hair. Yeah, super creepy. She's coming down from that same area, the top of that hallway where that large open game room is. Oh, it's a hub. So it seems like a lot of this stuff is going on up there. I just thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, maybe there is some sort of source there, some sort of intention zone. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good term. Intention zone. Right. But so at this point in his story, who's, who's had these experiences, right? It started with his brother, then his friend, and then he himself has had these experiences. Now we're going to hear his mom, the first adult to have an experience with potentially the same entity. Yeah. The chain of corroboration. Chain of corroboration. Yeah. <laughs> I say the corroboration train is pulling into Certainty Station. That's what I say. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Certainty Things Station. Things are happening and it's, they're being proved through corroboration. These nodes of truth. <laughs> the chain of corroboration is <laughs> pulling into Certainty <laughs> Station. <laughs> oh my God, it's so funny and stupid. <laughs> Time to move along. Okay. Um, but John, take us back into this tale. Things started getting weirder in the house. I noticed my cat always fixating on something in the upper corner of my room, like something was floating around or talking to her. It freaked me out, and anytime she would start doing it, I'd kick her off my bed. One night, my own mother woke me up at 2 a.m. I was 18 at the time. She asked in a very terrified demeanor, Honey, I need you to check under my bed. Of course, unlike any other brave, accountable son, I said, Yeah, no. <laughs> she wouldn't tell me why initially, but pressing her on the whole deal, she eventually told me she had woken up because she had heard screaming. This was no dream because she said she continued to hear it after she had woken up. And it wasn't coming from outside or downstairs. She said she heard it underneath her headboard. Almost as if it was, quote, Like they were being dragged to hell. Those were her words. We both checked and didn't see anything of note, 
and I can't remember if she went downstairs or not for the rest of the night. That's horrifying. Yeah. After this, often at night, I would be up and usually make myself dinner late, and almost every night for a few months, I would get a really anxious feeling being in the kitchen. What it felt like was as if someone strong, angry, big, and terrifying was yelling at you at the top of their lungs to get the f- out of there. Like you were definitely hated It did not belong there. It was awful when it would happen. Perfectly normal kitchen one second, and then boom. Hateful, sinister environment the next. That is weird. Then, one night, I saw what looked like a young kid walk across the kitchen archway. And then he was gone. That was unsettling. Yeah, I'd say. That to me sounds like something was passing through. Just how it changes. It seems like this is like a hot spot of all sorts of different... Yeah, yeah. Like there's a doorway or something. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking, yeah. Occurrences in the house started to pick up. More weird things started happening, and these were very frequent. Loud freaking bangs, crashing, and chaos. This came to a climax when one night, I was downstairs watching TV, and my mom was upstairs. All of a sudden, I heard the loudest crash I've ever heard in a house, coming from the garage. It sounded like all the shelving on the wall fell over and crashed on top of glass and metal. The sound shook the entire house. This was no earthquake. I've had it happen before, and this wasn't a bang. This sounded like everything falling off the walls. I quickly ran to the garage door, fully expecting to see carnage, but not a single thing was touched or had fallen. I inspected and searched around. My mom and I were pretty freaked out. After I moved out of the house and into my first apartment, I couldn't shake the feeling that whatever was at the house had actually attached itself to me. A few days after my roommate and I had moved into the new place, I had an experience that would confirm what I had been feeling. It was the night of a Ducks game and I was getting on my laptop to find out what the score was. I was alone in the living room when suddenly I heard the nastiest, most guttural growl come from my room. We didn't have cable yet and I didn't have any TV on or music. Literally sounded like one of those demon dog gargoyles from Ghostbusters. It scared the out of me. I remember the sound to this day. The activity continued. My roommate would say he'd sometimes hear me walking around to my living room or in the kitchen. But then discover that he was all alone in the house. I was never home when he heard these things. I eventually had to move back to my mom's place after my roommate decided to move home to save money My mom later moved out and my girlfriend, who is now my wife, moved in. She isn't one to admit to seeing things, but one time she saw something in our bathroom mirror while she was doing her hair. And she refuses to tell me even to this day exactly what it was. She'll never admit when she's scared, even horror movies. She'll get up and go to bed acting like the movie is dumb when it's actually scaring her. So one day, maybe she'll feel up to it. She was vulnerable and scared when she told me about it, but quickly zipped her lips and now denies ever saying anything about it. So this is interesting. At some point between this first submission from him, he spoke to her again about this, and she came clean with what she experienced. I submitted a story earlier, and I wanted to update the portion about what my wife saw. After speaking with her again about what happened around 2010, she finally told me what she saw. She was upstairs in the bathroom, blow-drying her hair. And when her hair flipped up, she saw a woman in the mirror standing behind her. With dark hair and a pale face, half of it covered in blood. She says she hasn't thought about it since it happened, but I know she doesn't like that house. She says it's full of bad energy. Yeah, no thanks. Imagine seeing that. That's like a a nightmare. Basically, Bloody Mary. Yeah. We've got the bloody face. 
female entity in the mirror, in the reflection. In the bathroom. And it sounds like what has maybe been following him since the beginning. I mean, it seems to be almost always female energy. Yeah. Remember the woman that came down the stairs in the robe? They did, first he thought it was his mom with the dark hair. It sounds like maybe the same entity. Creepy. At least wearing the same skin. Yeah. Gross. So um, there's a little epilogue to this account, and it seems like this entity, whatever it was or whatever it is, might still be around. Late last year in December 2021, my wife, my kids, and I had to stay with my mom for about two weeks after we sold our house and were waiting for our current house to be finished getting built. My wife was downstairs in the morning making coffee in the kitchen when she said she thought she saw my mom walk in because she could see a woman with long dark hair in the corner of her eye walk into the room and then come up and stand right behind her. She asked if she wanted some coffee but didn't get an answer. When she turned around, there was no one there. My mom was still in bed. I was in bed. The kids were still asleep. I'm pretty sure it's the same bloody faced woman from a decade before. The same creepy woman I saw descend the stairs and fade into the floor when I was a teenager. I know the area. There are a lot of unmarked graves around where those homes were built. My mom's friend lives near that development and has weird things going on in her house to this day. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Wow. For sharing that creepy story. Well, it doesn't sound like it's bothering him too much anymore, which is probably a good thing. Yeah. But those are some definitely freaky things that you probably never forget the rest of your life. Yeah. What an ordeal. And to go on that long. We, we've had experiences that are kind of like little, little dappling drops here and there of strange paranormal occurrences. Yeah. Little samplers. Little samplings. But they're so spread out and they seem to be so unrelated to each other. Right. You know, varying phenomena. Random acts of strangeness. The fact that it's the same thing following him around. Yeah. Very creepy. A truly haunted life. Uh, yeah. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Yes. Especially on Halloween. Yeah. Great Halloween story. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, he did say, this is interesting. He did say after he had left that house, he said he still feels whatever he was experiencing had attached itself to him. As he mentioned in the story, he said he still feels like that to this day. He said this, quote, I constantly have cold winds in my house around me at night when there isn't a window open. That would be freaky. Or I'll hear voices of people that aren't in the house calling me. I hate it. Ugh. So he's still experiencing this. Because the cold wind would definitely, yeah. especially if you have bad feelings and you just have had it happen so much, you just know like something's not good. You know, mm -hmm. you still got some of that spirit scum on you. Some of that residual wraith residue. Yes, Jeremy. Well, well said. Ugh. You're all, Spirit scum. All about the alliteration today. <laughs> wraith residue. Residual wraith residue. You've made a W and R worker as an alliteration. Spirit scum and wraith residue. Hey, people deal with it, man. It's a real thing. Yeah, stay safe out there. Starve those ghouls. Yeah. Especially on Halloween when the veil is thin. Yeah. But thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Seriously, thank you. We got to keep going because we have got some great stories, but that was, that was a great one. This might be a good spot to take a quick Halloween hiatus. Jeremy. Yes. What's coming up in the expansion? Can you give us a preview? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Halloween is upon us, and we are going to celebrate, ring it in, in a very festive way, I believe. With spirit scum. With spirit scum and residual wraith residue. All available at the door of the belief hole. So come trick-or-treating. I wrote a little thing. This will kind of break out what's happening in the expansion, guys. It's going to be very fun. Cue the music. Halloween is many things to many people, but chiefly, one could argue, it's a time of mischief of tricks and treats, a time of not only disguises and deception, but also of fortunes and futures and deals with devils. A time for ritual and a time for games. In this expansion, guys, we are going to cloak ourselves in the nostalgic spirit of All Hallows' Eve by recounting not only, you like this, John, peculiar parlor games of the past, but also darker rituals and cursed games of today will tell cautionary true tales of terror from bathroom summonings and fortune-divining mirrors to speaking with the dead. We'll even explore games they say children play, but behind the pieces and boards, real darkness lay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's gonna be fun. Cheese monster. Yeah, it, it, there's, I found some really creepy stories. I asked myself, what am I excited about this Halloween? You know, you kind of celebrate all month, you see it all month. And I thought, what excites me? And I thought just the atmosphere of really getting in the spirit of Halloween. And I looked into some 
cursed alleged games and rituals, some creepy stuff that people do to connect with the other side and some uh, tales of those experiences where things have gone horribly wrong. So it's going to be a very interesting episode, but also very festive. I'm excited. Yeah. Nice. Cool, guys. Well, here is a clip of that. If you're not a member to get the expansion, please go to bluehole.com, click on the big red join the expansion button, and you will get many, many bonus episodes just as long, just as produced, just as fascinating. Double the episodes, double the fun. So go sign up, become a member, and join us there for Halloween. And hit that like button if you're on YouTube. Yes, do that as well. Yeah, bam. All right, we'll be back with some more scary stories, and we'll see you on the other side of the break. Yes, roll clip. Access granted. If it's successful, the witch will rise out of the bowl of water in the room. Uh, That's not scary at all. Yeah, right? John, will you read that little paragraph there under that? This describes what happens. After La Segua nears, she will start to come out of the bowl slowly. Allow her to do it. But do not let her take her mask off. If she starts to take off her mask, you have to stop the ritual. If she takes it off, she can speak, and it will drive men insane. She will try to make eye contact, but do not look into her eyes, and do not tell her your name. When her shoulders are out of the bowl, make this simple request. Quiero trace objetos Magicos. I want three magic objects. That's what it said. (laughs) Then drop the offering in the bowl. If she begins to sink back down into the bowl, you did the ritual right. If she starts to rise out of the bowl farther, (laughs) you're f***ed. (laughs) She's angry. If she starts to rise out of the bowl farther, she is angry and you have to stop the ritual immediately. Do not try to ask her for anything other than what the ritual allows. I mean, if you have the composure to, to drop objects when a witch is coming out of a bowl of water in your room, I mean, that's <laughs> yeah, that's not happening. That's a freaky movie scene. Yeah, dude. If you want to read the whole thing, it's pretty creepy. Yeah. In what reality, even like the most like practiced occultist is going to like, this works and a witch starts coming out of the yeah. bowl. I'm like, All right, what's the next step? <laughs> As this witch is glaring You're trying at me. to drop turkey waddles like around her head as she's as she's <laughs> rising out of the wall. Yeah, right. <laughs> What's next on the list? Uh, What's the next step? Uh, Stop the ritual immediately. Jeff, read the next thing. <laughs> What's the next step? <laughs> oh, it, it is creepy though. <laughs> yeah. When the cool light of the blood moon beckons, the midnight call won't be ignored. And every creature of the night looking for love needs the right scent to snare their heartthrob. In partnership with Ruddy Man Grooming, the brothers of the Belief Hole have curated Night Stalker. A beard oil scent that blends the masculine earthy forest aroma with the seductive notes of tobacco and vanilla Mm. for a subtly sweet balance that will have your partner purring late into the evening. However the night moves you, Night Stalker Beard Oil is your loyal companion. Yes! So head over to beliefhole.com and click on the Night Stalker button. Available in beard oil, bombs, and butters. And don't forget to use the code BELIEFHOLE for 15% off your purchase. Whoa! That's BELIEFHOLE, one word, all lowercase. Night Stalker. Wow. For a superior breed of beard. Of beard. All right, welcome back, guys. Welcome back. The jack-o'-lanterns better be lit. Yes. The skeleton better be polished and fluffed. (laughs) (laughs) All right. We're getting right back into this episode with an extraordinarily terrifying story. Yes, we are. This story comes to us from a man named Chip, and his account took place in Marlow, Alabama, Baldwin County, to be exact. Mm -hmm. This is an interesting area. And this is the part of our episode where we're going to start to talk more about the land itself. Yes. Being cursed, being haunted. Saturated 
with the essence of paranormal possibility, right? Because of the the tragedy there. Yeah, that, there's a lot of darkness and bloody history in this area. A lot of battles fought, a lot of blood spilled into the earth. Yeah, long history of Native American battles. You, you had the Spanish coming in, the, then the French, then the British, the Revolution, the War of 1812, there were battles fought, the Civil War, all these events in this area. But let's get into his story and see what he experienced in this area, in this territory. Pretty frightening stuff. And by the way, when Chip's recounting this, You'll notice in his recounting of his experiences, he sort of compares his inexplicable experience to the sometimes laughable rationalizations that people have. And you'll hear this throughout all the accounts that occur in his very full paranormal experience. Jeremy, will you read this one? This I call the demon in the tree line. This takes place in Marlow, Alabama, in Baldwin County. In a nutshell, my wife is apparently clairvoyant, and now I have to fight a demon. Growing up, I have seen and witnessed many things that I cannot explain, but wrote off in various ways that, looking back on now, I see entirely different. I have always believed in spirits of the land and beasts of the trees, rocks, and water, but I have never been religious. One Thanksgiving, when I was four or five, we went to my maternal grandparents' house, which is in Marlow, Alabama a mile from my current residence. I was playing alone outside when I had a conversation with someone in the tree line. I never saw him, but I heard him. I see what you really are. He had a deep voice, and it sounded as though he had been gargling rocks. Know this for a fact. He showed me my deaths. Your death will be never. When I went inside, I found I had missed dinner. My parents asked me what took so long because my dinner was getting cold. I told them about the man and they remarked about my imagination. Thinking back now, that's when my Creole family and those with native blood began to avoid me. This is interesting. This is where he starts to talk about those deaths throughout his life that the thing in the forest had mentioned. I drowned when I was six in Gulf Shores. I watched my rescue from above. Again, my imagination. Around age eight, I saw a translucent man in the fog while walking my dogs. It was dark and a trick of the light. I've walked off snake bites. I was just tough, boys will be boys. While working for my uncle doing construction as a summer job, my hands were in a fuse panel. When someone hooked the main line to the power grid, I hit the opposite wall and everything went black. I woke up and walked it off. At 17, I enlisted. I have been shot and stabbed on a few occasions, including one round that hit a rib while bare-chested and stopped. They said I was too angry to die, and I was discharged for medical reasons. Eight years ago this coming summer, I married a good woman who has a lot of native blood in her. We moved into the current residence, a house built by my maternal grandfather and his brother on the side of Fish River in Marlow, Alabama. My great uncle lived there until his death in 2012. The last few years of his life, he always talked about seeing, quote, the black boy in the hallway and kitchen when the lights were out. And when he mentioned that he walked through a closed door, we assumed he was senile, seeing as he was well into his 80s. We've always heard footsteps in the house and made excuses, even when home alone. Sounds of scratching in the walls and ceiling. A squirrel must have gotten into the attic and fell into the wall. Sounds of a Zippo opening and closing neither of us smoke. Must be water pipes. The smell of struck matches. Old wiring. I'll find the bad outlet and fix it. A month after we moved in, the cat's food bowl flew across the dining room and hit the opposite wall. The cat was in my lap on the couch. My wife was in the kitchen fixing lunch. And the dogs were in the living room with me. The three areas are all completely open and can see each other. Eventually, I started seeing figures out of the corner of my eyes gone before I could turn to see them. Probably just schizophrenia, cool. Probably stress from work and my mind is slipping. When our firstborn came in 2015, my mother gifted us the rocking chair that her mother gave her when I was born. When we could get him to sleep in his room, which was rare, we learned not to look at the baby monitor cameras after dark. That's creepy. If he would start fussing, we could hear the rocking chair start to rock. 
Uh, it's creepy, but this is an old house, and a coincidence that it only happens when him or subsequently his sisters would cry in their rooms at night. After the chair started rocking, we would begin to hear a woman humming lullabies, which seemed to soothe the children. At my parents' house one day, I was humming the same tune to one of my children. My mother laughed about it, how that was the tune my Aunt Hazel would hum to my cousins. She passed away before I was born. One time, a coworker gave me a ride home and wanted to see the water. We started walking through the swamp when he got spooked and ran back to his truck. He told everyone at work he had seen something big watching him from the brush. A couple of months ago, I made a joke about the haint hiding my glasses and stealing my liquor again. My wife had me explain what a haint was. That's when she started telling me about, quote, the shadow man she keeps seeing in our home. She says she used to think it was me because he is tall and wears a jacket, like a trench coat. We never told her of my great uncle's hallucinations. Hell, I'd forgotten it until then. The more I researched, the more my wife and kids would see, including entities in the woods around our house and the swamp on the backside of the property, leading to the river. But nothing came to me. Monday, February 21st, 2022. We walked down the road to the restaurant. The girls started to get fussy, so my wife took them home while my son and I finished eating. On our way home, we crossed the abandoned building in the woods. I could feel something watching me. I've never felt such hate from anything before. As soon as I noticed it, my son turned towards the direction of the source of that feeling and asked me, What's that thing? I looked but saw nothing but I could still feel it. It's dark and heavily wooded. No lights here. Nothing, Bubba. Come on, was all I could say as I started keeping myself between him and it. I reached for my knife with my free hand, only to realize I left it and my phone at home. I felt naked before whatever it was. When we got home, I put him to bed and my wife asked me if I heard something in the woods. Did you hear anything in the woods on the way home? I asked. Like what? She explained the same scenario. Was it a coyote or a bear or something? That was evil, dear. That was a haint. What's a haint? You know, ghosts, spooks, spirits, demons. She laughed at my explanation and called her mother. They laughed at me for my use of the term. (laughs) They're from up north. They went on to tell me about ghosts they've seen, but this wasn't a ghost, they told me. It was an animal and I'm crazy. February 22nd, the next morning, the first thing my wife asked was, Who's Linda? I don't know a Linda. She told me about the dream the night before. Linda came to her. She said she was there protecting her and the girls the night before from the thing in the woods. What would require a spiritual guardian? And who the hell is Linda? I called my mother and asked if she knew of any Linda. Why? I explained everything. She began to tell me that everyone we know avoids my house, including herself, because they've all had experiences. They let me move in because I wasn't a believer. Then she wanted to know why I hadn't come to her sooner. Apparently, Linda was a lady that died in a house nearby and was an acquaintance of my great uncle's. Yeah, a lot of interesting stuff going on in this story. Layers upon layers. It's so interesting, the outside aspect again, the, the land, you know, as they're walking through the swamp, there's this thing that's exuding hate. You know, there's a, apparently a woman who died in a nearby home that's protecting them from something that's in the forest that is exuding this hate. What are these entities in this area? It's really interesting. Yeah, it does sound like the area itself is kind of haunted. Yeah. With some sort of supernatural frequency. He's right by a river too. And I always think about that. When I hear stories like this, rivers, waterways. Yeah, Fish River Yeah, runs right along his house and his maternal grandparents' house. It's all right there. Interesting. All right, sorry. Let's, let's continue. Last night, Wednesday the 23rd, I contacted a preacher I know and asked if I hypothetically were to inlay my hunting knife with silver. Can I square up with a demon? He explained that I cannot and that the church put the idea of silver out there to give people hope in the event of an encounter with demonic activity. 
I went on to explain my situation, and he said he knew it would go against the grain with me, but that I cannot fight it on equal ground. The only way to make it leave is to give it permission to leave, without ill intent in my heart. He suggested I research the area to see if anything happened in the past that could be affecting the land now. This thing scared me. It scared my wife. It scared my children. I felt threatened by it. What I'm going to say now is probably the craziest thing so far, but here it goes. I don't know how yet, but I plan to attempt to gather information and evidence. I will find a manner to meet this thing on equal ground, and I will fight it if I can. Good luck. Yeah. The only reason we haven't moved already is lack of funding. After the past few days, we plan to be out within a month, if we can, with help from our families. Though I understand these entities follow you, so it will not matter unless it is tied to the building and not our family. Now, that's interesting. You hear that a lot with these stories. People don't have the money. It's true. I mean, I always thought I would not stay in a haunted house, especially if I had kids, man. The darkness and the fear in places like that. But at the same time, like the real world hits home and you can't just pick up and go. A lot of people can't. Yeah. yeah. It's like every haunted house. Exactly. There's a reason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the biggest, you know, the biggest investment of your yeah. life. Like all your equity is tied up. It's just not easy to just walk away from it. Yeah. Even if you're running. Yeah, that's true. I mean, if you're, if you're running yeah. pay, paycheck to paycheck, you can't necessarily afford to break a lease or pay a deposit, you know. Yeah, what do you live on the street? Yeah. What if it's February in Ohio? Moving is very complicated. It's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. And when you have all the extra added stress of the haunting, <laughs> it makes it like a, man, even harder. Yeah. A terrible situation to be in. My heart goes out to you, Chip. Yeah, I feel bad because he said probably the craziest thing I've said so far, but I'm going to find a way to meet this thing on equal ground ground and battle it and I, I'll let you know how it goes. I was going to say, when did, he, when did he send this in? And, and I realized like he sent this in February Okay, and you know, we don't get through these very quickly. So I just read this this week. So I've written to him, but I haven't heard back yet. I hope, I hope yeah. they're doing okay. Let's find out. Cause I, yeah, that sounds pretty intense. We, yeah. Let us know if there's any developments, my friend. So he did say at the end of his uh, message that after talking with the priest, he decided to look into the history a bit of the area. And this is what he had to say. I did some digging online last night after my conversation with the preacher. The entirety of Baldwin County has had a barbaric and bloody past. Native Americans fought, the Spanish came, the French followed by the British. Bloody battles recorded during the revolution. The War of 1812, the Civil War. There have been times in these events where hundreds were massacred. During the War of 1812, the British incited a war band of 1,000 Creek Indians under Chief William Red Eagle to attack Fort Mims, where 500 men, women, and children were slaughtered. In retaliation, General Andrew Jackson was sent. Only 200 of the 1,000 survived. That's a lot of dead, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of blood in that land. This is one incident of many over the last few hundred years. I fear that even in times predating Native American oral history, this area was already a place of violence, and that it is just a part of the land. I will try to gather physical evidence. I'll send any findings I gather other than simply my word to you. I need to prove to myself that I'm not going crazy. I need my family to feel safe again. Well, we wish you luck in that endeavor, Chip, and uh, definitely keep us posted. Yeah. That's an intense story. I hope they're doing all right. That actually reminds me of something I saw on YouTube, just the ending part. It's like great skinwalker personal experience. Was a gamer, moved out to the smaller town, started experiencing all this like skinwalker activity, like weird video footage from all around his house. And he had a family and he just kind of was documenting it over a period of like six months. Oh, interesting. Actually, a pretty, pretty interesting stuff that some of the footage of the ghost that would appear in his yard was really compelling. Hmm. We should put that in the notes. Yeah. He has three parts to it, I think, mm -hmm. and did it over a period of several months and it was really good. Yeah, we'll link that in the show notes, guys. So, Jer, any more thoughts on Chip's story? Yeah, th I mean, I'll just say, yeah, this is obviously, I mean, he outlined the weirdness of this area, the darkness there, the blood in the ground, ripe for all kinds of supernatural activity. I just found kind of an oddball, actually, oddball uh, anecdote in that area. Uh, have you heard of Old Two Toes? No. Old Two Toes is someone you don't want to trifle with. Uh, he's an alligator. He's about 12 to 13 feet long. I know this is definitely not completely related, <laughs> but uh, imagine a 13-foot alligator that can walk upright and chase you. Glowing red eyes. In the early 1900s, apparently, 
Old Two Toes was a thing in Baldwin County. Basically, sightings of this gigantic alligator with demon eyes that could run upright and was missing two toes, apparently. Uh, You could tell his tracks because he was always missing two toes. And whoever caught his foot in a trap nailed the two toes to their shit. I forget the names. It was an interesting story. I'll link it in the article. Just a weird, uh, yeah. not that that's necessarily supernatural at all, but right. just a weird area. Well, it would have to be, I, I would imagine if there was any truth to that old tale, there, it would have to be some sort of shapeshifter sort of thing. Well, if it was actually... Because like, an alligator obviously doesn't have the legs to go banding about, on, you know, running around two legs. They're kind of bow-legged. Well, here's the quote. That's this, my feeling. This is a, a book by Harriet Brill Outlaw called Haunted Baldwin County, where this all took place. And this is some First River freakiness from the early 1900s. Old Two Toes, a 13-foot gator that terrorized the area, quote, residents in the northern part of the county began to swear that an alligator could be seen running so fast across their land that he could lift up his front legs and run on his hind legs, just like a human being. Can you imagine a 13-foot tall alligator (laughs) running at you? Some (laughs) auto travelers, I think this actually comes from an old newspaper that she quoted, some auto travelers even related that they would look out of their car windows late at night and see an alligator running on its back legs keeping up with the speed of the car. You know, that's interesting. That doesn't remind me of uh, skinwalkers, you know, running alongside the car. We just read a story last week about the swinging arm man that was like the size of a car. We did? Oh, yeah. Or wait, something to do with that. Yeah. I don't remember that at all. You don't remember the <laughs> swinging arm man? No. That its arms reached out like, how do you not remember that? It was a hat man episode. The thing that was chasing yeah, them. Oh, it was, it was somehow it was able to keep up with them and its arms were oh. yeah, extended in a very unnatural way. Remember that guy in Roger Rabbit? The bendy guy <laughs> that like, that was the creepiest freaking the, thing. The, the real life movie or like the live action movie of Roger Rabbit? No. Who framed Roger Rabbit? The live action movie? Yeah, that's what he's, that's what you're talking about. What do you mean? Yeah, I mean the, the movie. What do you mean the well, like live action It wasn't just movie. cartoons. It was, live action, I mean, there's animation. There's also yeah, like- Christopher Lloyd. Yeah. Where he's like that black sludge thing. Remember he gets rolled over though by yeah. that bulldozer Ooh. thing? Was that Christopher and Lloyd? It, they were, Yeah, they bulldozed. Might have been. Played the villain? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. What that a was weird such a movie. creepy character though. Yeah. He was just a guy though, wasn't he? Do you remember was that? Was he just like a dude? That got ran over? No, he was like a cartoon animation thing. It's been so long since I've seen that movie. It feels like an LSD trip or something now in my brain. I just remember that part was a very freaky part of the movie. It was very disturbing. Yeah. I mean, anytime someone's getting run over by a steamroller, yeah. it's pretty disturbing. <laughs> but then he turned into an animation. You, he's like dying. Oh, like do you like remember that? Okay, after he gets just... run over. Ugh. Yeah. That does bother me. Yeah. I don't like that, John. Give me a weird watch along. Some weird creepiness for Halloween. Anyway, talk about scary. Anyway, moving along. Uh, thank you so much for that story. That was really good. Yeah, Baldwin County sounds like an interesting place. Monroe, Alabama. Forever nearby, we'll have to swing through and scope out the scene. Hope you're doing better, Chip. Yeah, his account seems a lot more frightening than your uh, Tuto man, the uh, alligator guy. Well, let's get to our final freaky story of the Halloween episode, Chris. Let's do it. This one has been in the making for two years. I was always trying to figure out how to present her story because it was wrapped up in in so many different sorts of phenomena that are so tied together, if you think about it, like out-of-body experiences with the haunting connection, astral projection. Those all seem to be tied together in so many accounts. And so I thought, what a better way to do it than on this American Hauntings episode where we would finally get to tell her full tale. So we're going to start Brandon's account by jumping into the haunting that was taking place in her house and about to have her first child before we jump back in time and see where the origins of these things began in her childhood. So let's begin in her home in 2012. In 2012, my husband and I bought our first home. We were newlyweds and were in our early 20s, so we didn't have much in the way of belongings. And the house was pretty big. Think standard split entry in suburbia and a really neat wood floor that I always described as looking like it came from an old ship. We had two folding camping chairs in the living room and our bed and dresser were in the main bedroom. Generally speaking, the house was pretty empty until we got a bit more established in our jobs. We had been desperate to purchase a home and because we didn't have much in the way of a down payment, our offers were being turned down one after another. Finally, our realtor called us and said there was a home available that was part of a special program called the Neighborhood Stabilization Program. This program steps in and fixes up homes that have gone back to the bank, and then they will only loan to people who meet certain criteria, with an emphasis on married couples with children. 
We had looked at this home several months before, but we knew we wouldn't qualify since we didn't have children. Now the home was available again, and we were at the top of the list. I was shocked, because I knew that a woman with children had been chosen over us. Apparently she backed out and never said why. We didn't think anything of it at the time. We were just grateful to have our first home. Shortly after moving in, I was at the house working on school assignments and tinkering with rearranging the few things we did have in the cupboards. I was finishing up my degree in psychology and working part-time, and my husband worked full-time. Suddenly, I heard what sounded like the claws of a large dog moving quickly across the wood floor in the living room, and then down the hallway. I felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I looked for my dog, who was notoriously calm and loyal, always nearby. She was laying on her bed. Clearly, she had not been running through the house seconds prior. I was totally panicked and yelled to her to get outside with me. Let's go now! <laughs> she and I were very close, and the worst thing imaginable to me at that time was for something to happen to her. Wherever I was going to be, that's where I wanted her to be. I sat on our somewhat dilapidated back deck in my robe and slippers, and with a shaky voice and feeling exposed in every sense of the word, called my mom and explained what I had just experienced. I was totally unwilling to be in that house alone. Hello? Mom, I need you to come over. She agreed to come over and spend some time with me until my husband came home. The usual explanations came up in our conversation. Must be the furnace, new house and unfamiliar noises, Warmth from the window heating up the wood floor and making it crack and creak, etc. But none of that could explain why the sound moved so rapidly through the house. And towards me. Several months later, I was getting ready for work. My husband always started work much earlier in the morning than I did. I was stressed and in a hurry. For a brief moment, I took a pause in my rushing around and stood at the foot of our bed for a second. I don't remember what I was doing. Maybe deciding on my outfit or something. I suddenly felt a strong pressure on my upper back. So strong, in fact, that it pushed me face down onto the bed. Ah! I was bent over at the waist and my head was turned toward the window. I could see my arm on the bed and found that I could not move any part of my body. I was totally paralyzed and I had no idea if there was a physical person holding me down. The giveaway though, that this wasn't just someone physically attacking me was that I couldn't even scream. I remember just silently crying. Eventually, I was able to move and get myself out the door and somehow go to work. I was very upset to be leaving my dog home alone in that house. Over the years, I hated being alone in the house, especially after dark. I would try to make up reasons why I had someplace else to be if my husband wasn't home. It never actually felt like I was alone in that house. That would be pretty horrifying. Yeah. Being assaulted like that by an invisible force in your own home. It's the most primal fear. I mean, think about, I think that's one of the scariest things about ghosts. I don't know if you really think about this consciously, but the fact that you, you just can't see your potential enemy yeah. or a threat. Yeah. Invisible. Feel it every night at 3 a.m. Yeah. Can you imagine how scary it'd be if there were just a race of people that were just naturally invisible? And like you had to make sure the doors were like locked and sealed when you came in and out through like suction. <laughs> yeah, that'd be suction horrible. plastic. Like beings that actually could. Yeah, yeah like, hurt like we you. live with them. Like maybe they they work at the tax office. Like they have jobs, but like you have to put powder down on the floor so you can see if they, if anyone's entering your house that happens to be an invisible man. There would definitely be a different societal structure. That's a very weird thought, Jeremy. I'm just saying the fear, yeah. the concern of just that. Now put another layer of you know ghost on top of that where they can. Where they're actually dead. There's like an interdimensional. It's very weird. Yeah. But horrifying too, I'm sure, because also like if it's something that's not there or potentially like a, a dead person or maybe an evil entity, it's, what is it, what's its motivation? Why is it? Yeah. Why is it pinning you down? What does it want from exactly. you? Exactly. That's obviously the horrifying part. You yeah. just don't understand why it exists. You have no idea what it is. Yeah. We have, there's no way to understand it. I mean, really. the invisible person who works at a tax collecting agency, like Jeremy suggested, you know what his motives are. Yeah. I guess at least you're familiar with. Right. He wants your tax. But yeah, yeah, that would be horrifying. Not understanding what the threat is, I guess, is just as scary as not being able yeah. to see it. And what its what its motivations are. 
And so this is the beginning. <laughs> that was very the late. To. <laughs> no, you're. That's how late it oh, was. Oh, the tax joke. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's good. Um, and so this is just the uh, first part of her story, but it's not where it begins. But I will say real quickly, just an interesting little note there where she mentions the, the floor. Did you notice that when she talked about the floor, how it always reminded her of an old ship? Like, I just mm-hmm. wonder where maybe this floor came from somewhere else, or maybe it's oh. just, you know, something you hear about wood being barred from place to build something, especially in areas where there's a lot of history. Right. You wonder, was there something attached? Yeah, like some material can absorb energy, right? It was just a far out there idea, but popped into my brain. Reel it back, Chris. Going to reel back in? Back in the old skull. Yeah, no, definitely uh, not something I want to be a part of. No, we will not be coming over, Brianna. <laughs> <laughs> She's not there anymore, but we'll get to that. Okay, so this next part of the tale, we're going to go back in time, and we're going to look at the origins of what might be occurring to her. Some really, really fascinating experiences that she has. That was really interesting. In her childhood. And again, this is where we start to get the connection with, at first, sleep paralysis, but eventually out-of-body experiences and astral attacks. Okay, here we go. As things went on, I was having more and more sleep paralysis episodes, something I had experienced quite frequently in my childhood home. The typical episode would involve waking up, opening my eyes in the dark, seeing shadows moving across the room, and particularly above my face, not being able to breathe and not being able to move any part of my body. It was always panic inducing. Eventually, I learned to focus all of my energy on curling my pinky finger. This took incredible effort, but would consistently result in the episode ending and my body forcefully flipping over onto my hands and knees, where I would gasp for air until I was calm enough to lay back down. I learned that it was imperative to get up and move around in my bed, otherwise I'd slip into another episode immediately. The earliest memory I have of this is probably when I was six or seven years old. In fact, I historically had strange occurrences at night from a young age. I remember one time waking and sitting up in my bed because I could hear lots of noise. I was an only child and my room was in the basement and my folks were always very calm and quiet, so this was unusual. The sounds were distant, clanging, hammering, and people yelling back and forth. Definitely not my parents. I looked around my room and saw a line of Chinese people carrying railroad ties on their shoulders, one after the other. They were looking right at me. And I think I was maybe 11 or so at the time, I remember pulling my blankets up to my neck because I didn't want these unknown men to see me in my pajamas. They were all wearing conical hats, and I remember the ground was just dry dirt. Funny that in that moment, the thing I was concerned about the most was a stranger seeing me in my skivvies. There was a railroad that ran behind the end of our neighborhood, but at that age, I was completely unaware of the details surrounding the construction of the CPRR. I suppose it's possible that I heard a train in my sleep, but it still does not explain my vision of the people building it and how accurate it was, as I later learned. Later in life, moving into that house, that's when everything I had experienced when I was younger really came into focus. At this point, we had been in our house for about four years when we had our son. This is when the sleep paralysis episodes really picked up, which I found to be terribly disturbing. In fact, they were no longer just sleep paralysis events. They were full-on out-of-body experiences every single time. It actually took me a really long time to figure out I was having OBEs. For months, I was convinced something was messing with me. We had these bedside lamps, a touch-style lamp, where you just touch the base of the lamp and don't have to turn on any switches or push any buttons. Oftentimes, I would wake up from a disturbing dream and believe I was seeing things in our room. I would attempt to touch the lamp, but nothing I did would turn it on. I would always just roll back over and try my best to ignore what was going on and fall back asleep. Finally, one day I was so mad at whatever was messing with me that I got out of bed and tried to flip the wall switch to our light fixture, knowing this would wake my husband up. Here's the moment that changed everything. I couldn't flip the switch. My fingers kept going through it, 
Had I died, I wondered? I turned to look around the room and saw my husband and myself still asleep in the bed. Sheer and total panic ensued. It was suddenly clear to me at that moment that for a very long time, I'd been experiencing OBEs, but was not aware. Ah, what a moment for realization. I, I think that it's such an interesting concept there that you, when you realize that this whole time, probably for months, she's been having these experiences at night where things are coming, bothering her and, and waking her up. Yeah. And she would try to turn the lamp on and it wouldn't work. And then after months of this, over and over again, she eventually realizes when she tries to go up and turn the other light on that she's been having these out-of-body experiences the whole time. She's been out of her body all these nights in a row and didn't even realize it. Well, that's what's creepy is the things that she's seeing, she might be seeing them in the astral. Exactly. She's already out of body when she's seeing them, maybe still right. laying still in her body, but technically maybe she has already left in a sense. And she's, so she's seeing beyond the veil, essentially seeing things that are around. So she thinks there are things coming into her world, messing with her. In reality, she might've just entered them not knowing it until that night where she tries to flick the light on. Exactly. Definitely creepy. Yeah, this is interesting because this, this continued on for a while, these out of body experiences, and they kind of climaxed in this really crazy event. Yeah, she kept having these. And at one point she even said she felt like she was pulled back by what felt like a cord. That's familiar. Which was unfamiliar to people, the silver cord that people experience all the mm -hmm. time in OBs. It was interesting because, you know, she'd heard people say, this is something some people seek out, the ability to astral travel or uh, have an out-of-body experience. And with right. her personality type, she knew she wouldn't be able to relax in that kind of situation. And she did everything she could to intentionally try to prevent these OBs from happening. And at one point when she was in one, she had the thought that she said, quote, I had an infant sleeping in my crib in my house. I just couldn't handle the thought of him essentially being alone in the house with a mom that was not actually in her body. So it's interesting to think that like, you know, you have a responsibility. You can't just float around in the astral plane. <laughs> right. It's just weird to think of it that way. But then, of course, it gets dark and she began having these, she wasn't sure if they were dreams or OBEs, but in these experiences, she was fighting some kind of what she called an evil entity in her son's room. She described it as all out war at one point. Yeah. And she said the need to protect her kid was like the fire of a thousand suns inside her body. So very intense experience. That's an intense way to describe something. Yeah. Sounds very visceral. Well, it's, it's interesting to me because with all these experiences, these OBE, you know, she had sleep paralysis as a child, but never had the astral projection. At least she wasn't aware of it. Of course, we know that's always connected with journeys out of the body. Right. But it's interesting that this is all leading up to, this is climaxing when, when she's about to have her first child. Right. These experiences are happening. She's starting to astral project and she's fighting this demon thing while in her soon to be baby's room that they're planning on. That's interesting. Having these crazy experiences during her maternity leave which also gets scary for her because she's home alone for long periods of time in this house. Well, we talked about in the paranormal pregnancy episode, things being drawn during that time. Yeah, right, exactly. That time of entering in the world, this reality. Okay, so over like the next two years, she has other strange experiences where she's feeling things like cats rubbing around your legs as they do walking in that figure eight pattern. She's having a weight on the bed like an animal or a person. These things just continue and continue. She's having her bed vibrating around all these uh, nights that she's having these out-of-body experiences, right? This common, she starts looking into Robert Monroe's work and looking in, you know, when she's trying to do what some of us have done, where you have an experience, you look into what this is, you find patterns. And, you know, all this is kind of building up again. She's got crazy technical problems with televisions, radios, lights flipping on and off, volumes going up and down. Oh uh, yeah, astral gremlins coming in. Yeah, always happening when her husband's gone. He comes home, everything stops. And then that's where the story picks back up. Yes. And here we go. <laughs> Art's ready? ready. Art's ready for the next part. <laughs> About the time my son was roughly 14 months old, he was quite social in the grocery store, always saying, when passing others. At that age, children don't have the ability to engage in imagination yet like that. He never said this to his toys and only to people he saw in person. One day, I had him on his back on his changing table. While I was looking at him, I noticed he was focusing intently. He seemed to be looking above me, just past my shoulder. Just as I was having this awareness, he grinned and said, and waved, but not to me. 
another hair-raising moment. I finished changing him and tried my best to put the thought out of my mind. At this point, I was convinced there was something hanging out with us. About four months later, things got really weird. My husband and I were awake before our son and were in the living room visiting on the couch. Suddenly, we heard our son screaming in terror. He never screamed like that. Before we could even get off the couch and run to him, he came tearing out of his room. I'd never seen him run like that. He was absolutely terrorized. We were trying to understand what happened. He explained that there was a man in his bed, quote, holding him. This was the first strange experience to occur where my husband was home. We both stormed into his room. Of course, there was no one there. And for context, his room, as well as ours, was on the upper level of the house. We lived in a pretty safe neighborhood and we kept the place locked like Fort Knox because no matter how nice an area you live in, crazy people do crazy things. So there's no way someone could have been up there. We opened his closet, looked under his bed. I mean, we tore the place apart. From there on out, every once in a while, my son would be in the middle of playing and running around the house and would suddenly come back running down the hallway, screaming and crying because, quote, I know my kid. I know when he's shrieking from fun, screaming from a meltdown, whining high-pitched from being too tired, etc. To this day, I've never heard him scream like he did in those instances. All right, so basically at this point, she knows something's in this house. Or, you know, she's had her own experiences. Obviously, yeah. Something has been attacking her child. Now something is in her child's room holding him at night, terrifying him. So what does she decide to do? She decides to take control of her home. A friend recommends having a a painting of Archangel Michael. She keeps that in there. She puts pink Himalayan sea salt under his bed. She puts salt around the house in different places. They go around the house and clap in the empty corners of the home. I guess that does something. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Woo! Got to try that. that, uh, Good job, ghost. (laughs) (laughs) You give a little encouragement. It goes away. (laughs) Go to the light. Uh, She said it's supposed to break up. Break up the uh, stale energy or something? Break up the stagnant energy. I guess that's the concept. Interesting. Um, Yeah, it sounds like it makes sense. She's doing all this while her husband's away because he's, at this point, pretty skeptical still, even though he's seen his son come out screaming. And this is interesting. So this this seems to have worked for a while. But then her son develops an imaginary friend. That's never good. This becomes very bizarre. Interestingly enough, shortly after the attempts to cleanse the house from whatever it was harassing my child... My son created an imaginary friend that he named Concrete. Now, we were really thoughtful about his exposure to TV. He never had a tablet. He didn't watch any scary shows or TV unattended. After asking him a few questions, he explained to me that he and Concrete were in the same, quote, Christmas box that was buried in the dirt. I had no idea what he meant by that. We kept our Christmas things in Rubbermaid totes, but we've never put one outside let alone in a hole in the ground. A year or so later, I went with a friend to a local tea house where a psychic was doing group readings. Given my long life experiences with the strange and unusual, I'm pretty open-minded. But I do certainly value critical thinking, and given my degree in psychology, I am very aware of how easily people can be duped. We were seated outside, and it was a lovely afternoon. All of the readings were going well, no dramatics, Just super sweet conversation and sharing. Then she got to me. I've never met this woman, and we didn't give any personal information when signing up for the event. The staff at the tea house didn't keep track of where people sat or who anybody was. I am convinced that there were no theatrics happening. So the psychic turned toward me and suddenly swung her arm out and grasped onto the back of the wooden bench she was sitting on. She placed both feet flat on the grass and clearly looked unwell. We made eye contact, and she said, quote, I feel spinning. She went on to say that it's possible that there was just a conglomeration of bad energy in the house, rather than a poltergeist in the typical definition. Either way, she encouraged me to try to clear it out or maybe even consider moving. She seemed genuinely disturbed. I loved our house. We had a nice big yard, and we were within walking distance to a really great elementary school. I had no intention of moving. In fact, 
My husband had semi-seriously, semi-jokingly, mentioned selling several times and I always shut down the conversation. So I decided to speak with some neighbors and I got a little bit more history about the house. I was informed that the last two families that lived there had extremely volatile divorces. Not much else was said. I also know that the house sat vacant for a full year before we bought it. The yard was barren and pretty pathetic when we moved in, but I loved to garden and maintain the yard. But as we attempted to bring life to a pretty desolate space, we started uncovering some weird things. There were several bags of trash buried around the yard, and we even discovered that someone had poured concrete at the base of the lilac bushes. which explained why they struggled to survive and eventually had to be removed. Okay, did you catch that? I thought that was interesting. That's super creepy. Yeah. That's super creepy because, first of all, the son's imaginary friend, whose name is Concrete, said that he and her son were both from Christmas boxes. Is that right? Buried in the yard? Lived in a Christmas box buried in the yard. Buried in the yard. And then later she finds, after she sees the psychic, she finds... Concrete oddly poured around the lo- the garden. Yeah. Like somebody didn't want somebody digging in the garden, which inevitably killed the lilac bushes that were there. Right. But what's under the concrete? Why? It just seems creepy. Yeah. Is there something strange in a box under that concrete? Is this potentially impetus for maybe one of those volatile divorces that occurred in the house before they moved in? Is this partially why the house stood vacant yeah. for a year or so? Just creepy, creepy coincidence. Right. If it's a coincidence. Yeah, they call me concrete because I'm buried under the concrete by the lilac bush. Yeah. By the way, your son lives there with me in this box under the concrete. Yeah. That's really disturbing. It reminds me of that ghost to ghost am story about the dead man who would come and visit the child and then take him to his home, which was a box in the ground, in the graveyard. And the boy didn't know what a graveyard was or or a grave. Yeah. Very creepy. Very Halloween-y. So eventually they move out, as you might expect. She goes through this horrible depression, uh, kind of out of nowhere. She's familiar with depression because she, you know, has a degree in psychology and had experience with anxiety, but never depression like this. Uh, Her dog dies. It's awful. They have strange neighbors start acting stranger and stranger. That was kind of like the last straw. So six weeks after she has this sort of breakdown, six weeks from then, they're completely moved out and they're staying with the in-laws. And she says... Although I've had an unbelievable amount of synchronicities and interesting experiences, I have not had a sleep paralysis episode, OBE, or otherwise spooky experience since moving. We've been out of the house now for a year and a half. Really, I think whatever was going on there had a pretty strong hold on me. Moving out was extremely emotional for me. Now a year later, the depression has completely resolved. My son no longer talks about concrete or the man in his bed. The same electronics we were using there no longer flake out. It's been a huge relief. Yet, I have a great deal of gratitude for everything I learned through that time. Again, I really enjoy the show and appreciate so much the content and a safe place to share experiences. Well wishes, Brianna. Wow. Pretty intense story. I guess now she's living in Idaho and she's uh, they're happy and living in a nice forest. It's by Idaho is a great state. Yeah, beautiful, yeah, beautiful state. Definitely. Good for you, Brianna. Way to get out of that. Yeah. Yeah, good for you. I'm glad that you're away from that stuff. Let that be a lesson to all of you would be Haunted house buyers. <laughs> Don't do it. If you know. Yeah, it's not worth the deep discount. If you're aware. Yeah. I think they have to reveal that. I, only in some states. Not Pennsylvania. For, I just came across it on a blog. But I think California, maybe you have to reveal it. Pennsylvania is like freaking really haunted, I think, right? <laughs> that's why they don't want to make a part of the law. <laughs> no one be able to sell a house. I think that's <laughs> the tagline on, on their license plate. Freaking really haunted. <laughs> oh, is that Jeremy? No, it has some of the oldest settlements. I do think Pennsylvania is a very haunted state. It's, yeah. just, it's very old. Very historical. A lot of history. Yeah, it's interesting, John. The rock there, too. There's so much of that. I forget what kind of rock it is. Oh, yeah. Granite? But when we were out there for Gettysburg, you have all these beautiful, giant, jutting granite rocks that are coming out. Oh, the old tape theory. Exactly. You hear about stone tape theory. You hear about capturing energy. Energy from historic traumatic events. A sponge. Fascinating stuff. Anyway, yeah. I think everyone who submitted stories over the years, this was a two years ago, this story was submitted. It was just a, it was an epic one. So we had to figure out how to do it. But so everyone who's like, why haven't they said my story yet? Well, some of these take time and you can't get it to all of them, yeah. but we do appreciate them. Yeah. It's just impossible. But we, yeah, we appreciate. And same with email. Yeah. If you don't hear from us, it's not because we don't love you. That's true. It's just, we get overwhelmed sometimes. There's only three of us. 
Yeah, sadly. Until we develop our cloning machine. But yes, I think these were excellent stories for Halloween. At least they tickled my spooky bone. Yeah, we hope you guys enjoyed them. Hope you enjoyed the atmosphere that we tried to create. And we will create even more of an atmosphere, we hope, for a special Halloween extravaganza spooktacular from the Believe Live Hall. stream. Neat. Live stream. Neat indeed. It shall be very neat. <laughs> <laughs> it shall be a great... That's cool. It is cool. It'll be a great creepy time. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be fun. We, it's been a long time since we've done a live stream. Spooky. Very spooky stuff. Very, maybe the most spooky stuff. Um, yeah, it's going to be a great time, guys. If you can make we it. We might have a call online. We'll see if we can make that work yeah. with our new setup. Well, we'll see. A lot of things we're trying to put together yeah. last minute to make this happen, but we know a lot of you want this. We definitely want it too. It will occur on Halloween, officially. Excellent. Yes. October 31st, Halloween Eve. Yes. Monday. Monday. Love it. Yeah, it's going to be a great time. Yeah, we'll, we'll update you guys. Keep your eyes open. Oh, by the way, I wanted to say... A happy, happy birthday to Fiona Kirk. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Who I like to call the secret queen of Halloween. Not so secret, though. Yeah, she was born on October 31st, John, and she had a special message for the show (laughs) that her father, John, a good friend of ours, was so generous in sending. Very short little bit of a bit of a critique. I don't think their stories are real, real and they're not scary. (laughs) <laughs> how about that it hurts a little bit she's got a little attitude I'm not so sure about this little girl anymore Fiona if you're listening we will do our best to make them even scarier for you I bet this one scared you Fiona and we promise they're real unless that keeps you up at night we scare you out of your pants is what we're gonna do <laughs> but yes happy birthday Fiona this is her birthday there's a reason it wasn't scary Fiona yeah and it's because of this we don't want to scare anybody I love that clip Great clip. That's a good one. That's a good one, John. Happy birthday, Fiona. Uh, no, I, but these, I bet these stories scared her. And yes, these are all real stories from real listeners. Yeah. They scared me. Pretty traumatic experiences this evening. So I hope- We hope they scared you for Halloween, but also imparted a little bit of hope, a little bit of humanity, because that's yes. what the show is all about. The magic, the mystery, and Halloween. <laughs> And normally this is where we would say thank you to all of you amazing people and name name names. All the people who signed up at the, the higher tiers to get their names read, Black Eyed Cool Kids, Dogman Whispers, etc. But because this episode uh, was so long in, in producing and putting out here and we want to get out on time, we're not going to be able to do it this time. But next time, you will hear more names of yours. Suffice it to say, thank you for your support. We love you all very much. And we will see you on Halloween. Yeah. It's a bit of a bit of a cramped time this time. All right, guys. Now get out there and enjoy the season. There's only a little bit of it left, so make sure you take advantage of those falling leaves. That's right. Go to YouTube and subscribe and click the bell button so you get notified too. That's kind of key. Otherwise you might miss us. All right, guys, happy Halloween. And we'll see you next time on Belief Hole. Hole. some sort of source there some sort of intention zone that's a good that's a good term intention zone some sort of a uh, weird space where floating women come from right now where's that i'd like to get one of those rooms um <laughs> so <Sorry. laughs> that's such a dumb throwaway comment i am sorry <laughs> what did he say i could tell in your eyes that you didn't even you didn't even <laughs> care about saying it but you just felt you said we're you this, needed to say something this room where the floating women come from and i said i could get me one of those rooms <laughs> Oh my god. That's so good. <laughs> um That's so good. That was great, Chris. I'm lonely.
like this is like a hot spot of all sorts of different doorway or something. Yeah, dude. That's exactly what I was thinking, yeah. That reminds me of a classic Coast to Coast story where this guy... No one cares. We're going <laughs> further. <laughs> Just kidding. Further than anyone has ever gone. We're going further. <laughs> In a spooky story. <laughs> I don't think jumping it that way. I think that we're continuing on <laughs> and ignoring me. <laughs> Jeremy, you look like a garbage man. Doing what a garbage man can. I feel like a garbage man. Throws away metal and glass and wood. <laughs> garbage man? Oh, because oh, I'm all pixelated? I thought you meant because of like my beard and my... Just a little light would go a long way, Jer. Well, what's wrong? What's wrong with me? Nugs, chillin' and grindage. <laughs> <laughs> Nugs, chillin' and grindage. That's old school. I love the sense of uh, the end of this clip from Encino Man. I love that it starts to get serious. Like there's an intense moment when he says grindage. Listen to the last note. The only thing you have ever cared about in your life is Nugs, chillin' and grindage. <laughs> you motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it was a serious part. He was actually like really mad. That's at him. true. He was mad at Pauly Shore, right? Yeah. He's like, buddy. Oh, dude, is that the guy from, uh, was that Samwise? Yeah. Rudy. I forgot that was him. Yeah. What was his name? He was in uh, Stranger Fingers. Stranger Fingers? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that's funny. Stranger Fingers. He was in Stranger Things? Yeah. In the second season, I think. He was like Winona Ryder's boyfriend, and oh, then he got right. murdered by devil dogs. Devil dogs growling here and burning everywhere. It was really sad how he died. He like watched him die, and everyone's kind of like, well, we're sad, but we also wanted to get back with the sheriff guy, so <laughs> bye. That's how I felt. He was robbed. When we could get him to sleep in his room, which was rare, we learned to not look at the baby. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> I read that wrong. <laughs> he was ugly. I read that wrong. Don't look at the baby. <laughs> it's baby monitors. Just don't make eye contact with a baby ever. How <laughs> fucked up did that baby turn out? That would make the story a lot weirder. Yeah.